Well, hello once again, and welcome to another lesson uh, on Jesus and on the gospel and from God's word. Uh, we uh, want to say something here first. Uh, it's May 13th now, and we continue to, uh, of course, all of us uh, work through the pandemic. And uh, I just want to assure you that the elders and the ministry staff uh, continue to um, uh, discuss and uh, plan and think about how are we going to uh, open worship back up and what will that look like and when will that happen? And so, of course, I don't have any answers at the moment on any of that and, and the elders do not either, but um, but they are prayerfully looking at that question uh, and thinking about uh, what will that look like. Um, I know already that uh, the ministry staff, they have been Daryl and Jess and, and um, primarily Jimmy and, and Daryl. I'll get it right here in a second. Um, Daryl and Jimmy have been looking at the auditorium and how we can set up chairs and have multiple services and uh, perhaps uh, some way of having different parts of the congregation meet. It all depends upon how the government uh, recommends relaxing rules and, and how many we can have at one time and mask wearing. And so stay tuned for all of that. I know you want to get back to worship and I want to get back to worship and, uh, and uh, all of us collectively being together once again. And so uh, I guess it's just a little more wait and have some patience. And so, uh, but just wanted you to, to hear that, that yes, those discussions are taking place. And, and how do we do that safely? And how do we do that uh, in a way that we can, uh, of course, honor God and, and worship him, but also do it in a communal fashion. And so, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and turn now to scripture. I'm going to start in Matthew, I mean, excuse me, Mark chapter 5. And Mark chapter 5 is one of these places uh, where um, I often use whenever I'm studying with individuals uh, who have not yet obeyed the gospel and have not yet been baptized and, and, and uh, joined with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so I like to start with Mark 1.1 1, 1 because Mark starts with that question. Who is Jesus? And he says it simply, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so you know that, that Mark's focus is going to be on, okay, this man named Jesus was actually the Son of God. It's very much written uh, to people who are not Jews, who are more just like the Romans of the first century or Gentiles today. And so who is Jesus? And then... Um, we turn over throughout the book, of course, and we see Jesus doing these miracles and doing these amazing things. And he's answering that question. He's answering the question that, well, who is this Jesus? He's the son of God. And so we often, when we look to the text, we will do this with the text. And so I'm going to do it, but I don't want to lose sight of what he actually physically did either. But we'll often look at this text and we'll say, look at what he did physically. Well, Today, Jesus can do that spiritually. He can do it physically too, right? He is the son of God, so he can do whatever he wants. And so when we look at some of these great um, stories, like chapter five here, one through 20, uh, he's, of course, uh, healing and uh, doing all kinds of great things. Matter of fact, let's step back up and we'll look at chapter four, starting in verse 35. On that day when evening had come, this is chapter four of Mark. He said to them, let us go to the other side and leaving the multitude, they took him along with him. And just as he was in the boat and other boats were with them and there rose a fierce gale of wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. And he himself was in the stern asleep on the cushion and they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care? Do you not care? that we are about to die. And of course, being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And of course, he then challenges them about their faith. And they ask that, that important question, do you not care? 
Do you do you not care? And so, you know, it's true today. Jesus cares what's going what's happening in our own lives. He cares intimately about every detail about what's happening to us. And and so it's a it's just a great way to study with people and a great way to remind ourselves that what can Jesus do? He can calm storms. Well, who's the only one who can calm a physical storm? God. But then you, of course, take that to us. Well, what about storms in your own life? The big things that are happening, the roaring wind and all the the terrible traumatic event that's maybe swirling around your life at some point in your life, what can Jesus do? He can calm the storm. So if he can calm a storm out on a lake, he can calm the storm that's in your life. And so this section of Mark really lends itself to that kind of of, uh, reasoning and that kind of, of good news. And so something that I think is very useful when you're studying, especially with non-Christians once again, and with our children, you know, they need to hear that message. Yes, if he can calm storms in the real world, he can calm storms that are in my life today. And so, uh, and that goes on and on, right? Chapter 5, 1 through 20. Um, here he's he's talking about uh, this man who's who's running around in chains and the ch- he's broken the chains and he's crazy and Satan's got a hold of him and, and, uh, there's demons in him. And, and, and the big question here is, what could people do about this? You know, they tried putting him in chains, but he broke the chains. They tried reasoning with him. You couldn't reason with a, a madman. They tried to help him, but he was stronger and he would overtake them and he would run away from them. And so, so when you ask that question, what could men do? Uh, men could do nothing about it. And so there are situations, there's storms that are so bad that that I don't know the answer and you don't know the answer. But Mark here is telling us Jesus knows the answer, that the Son of God can do something about it. And so he concludes that section of healing the man who's been demon possessed. He concludes it by saying in verse 20 of Mark 5, and he went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled because they knew that they had all tried and failed. They the, the chains bore witness of that, that men could do nothing, but Jesus can do something about it. And so that goes back and forth throughout this, te- this text uh, with these just one illustration after another of how Jesus will heal someone, bring comfort to someone, calm a storm. And the question is, what could man do? Nothing. And and yet Jesus could do something about it. And that all culminates in the last part of John of Mark chapter 5 here. And so let me just read that part and we'll be finished. And so uh, starting in verse 35, while he was still speaking, there came from the house of the synagogue official saying, your daughter has died. So Jesus has been asked to come and heal a girl who is sick. But then he's interrupted and then news comes. We're sorry, your daughter's already dead. And Jesus, overhearing what was spoken, said to the synagogue official, don't be afraid. Just believe. Stop being afraid and believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John. And they came to the house and entering in, he said to them, why are you guys all crying? The child has not died, but is asleep. They, of course, all begin laughing at him. But in reality, Jesus is laughing at them. Because Jesus knows the real reality. He understands what it's really like. And so he barges in there and goes, why are you all crying? Knowing what he's about to do and the power that he has and that God is in control. It just doesn't make sense to the son of God that they would be all upset. This child has not died. He's, she's only asleep. They all started laughing. But then he said, shoot, get away. He then took along the child's father and mother and his own companions, and he goes into the room. And taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl rose and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given to her to eat. 
So it's that it's that final. What could men do about this? When 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 the doctor says there's no hope. When 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 our society says nothing can be done. When medicine, when everything is exhausted, the money has been spent. There's nothing left to do. Jesus says, "That's my moment. That's my moment when I can still do something." So even death can't stop him. Therefore, he must be the Son of God. And that's the conclusion Mark wants us to make. But does he care enough about our deaths? Does he care enough about us? And of course he does. And later on, Mark will say that in chapter 1045, that that he did not come here to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life up as a ransom for our lives. And so Jesus cares abundantly. How much to the death for you and I to gain eternal life? And so this section is a powerful section, and, and uh, it's, it's a great place to share with others, uh, maybe others who are struggling with storms in their lives or with difficulties. And it's like, wow, he can raise people from the dead. I think he can solve and be with you during your problem right now, whatever it might be. And so uh, we, we serve a powerful God. It's just so fascinating to think about these, these texts. Um, and that whole concept of resurrection that's that's intertwined in this. Because he's he's saying to them, I can resurrect this girl. And he does it. So it's proof that when he says, I can forgive I can forgive sins, I can resurrect people spiritually, he can do that too. And it's interesting, the only the only time Jesus will quote a, a, a minor prophet is when he quotes Jonah of all the ones to quote. And it's interesting, he quotes Jonah about his own life when he simply says, just as Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days, so too will the Son of Man be buried and then resurrected. And so Jesus has the power of the resurrection. And he uses that illustration of a Jonah who who needed to experience, in effect, spiritual death by being buried in water and, and being swallowed up by a fish. And then, he, and then there was that resurrection as he figured out that what is he doing in a fish? He should call upon the name of the Lord. And he did. And then the fish spits him out. And so there's that, that powerful symbol of resurrection. It's interesting, of all the text, that's why I'm not God, I would have picked a different text of all the minor prophet text uh, to quote. That would have not been mine, but that's why Jesus is Jesus. And he quotes that and uses that as an illustration of his power, that he can resurrect us, that he can take people that are so far gone that they're running in the, have you ever said that? Wow, that person's like running in the opposite direction of God. They're like the opposite of God. And yet, and that's what Jonah was doing. And yet, God resurrected him, symbolically with that fish. And Jesus is resurrected himself. And he has the power of the resurrection today with our lives. And so, how all that neatly works together. For me, that's great comfort. For me, that's astounding. And I hope that brings faith to you too. I just, I love those kind of connections whenever I can see that Jesus has the power of God. That... There's an Old Testament character who had to go through water in order to be resurrected. And today, we too, as we join with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we go through water. So maybe that's one reason he mentions Jonah, is there's that, that baptism of Jonah. And we go through baptism. And so there's that, that resurrection that we all experience. How do I know I've been resurrected to a new life? How do I know that I'm a Christian that's going to have eternal life with my father. How do I know that's true? I did, it's not because I get some special feeling. It's not because I was even baptized. It's only one way I know that I, am, that I have eternal life. The Bible said, join with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus through waters of baptism. And I did that. And I trust that God's word is true. And the more I trust that God's word is true, the more I trust that I will be with him for eternity. Because he said that's the way it is. And so 
we have a powerful God who, who deeply cares about us. And this is a text that shows that, that uh, Mark chapter four and chapter five here, it's just, it, it's just so overt. Teacher, do you care? Do you not care that we're going through this? And Jesus is like, of course I care. It's all I think about. All I think about is being with you forever and making that happen. And so does God care about us? Yes, more than we could possibly imagine. What a great God that we serve. And what a great, uh, under, what just a great illustration Mark gives of the power of, of Jesus to calm storms and heal people from the dead. And illnesses were, again, the illness is 12 years and the doctors had tried everything. And, and Mark makes a point of saying that at the hands of many physicians, she had spent all her money, but there had been absolutely no help, but rather had grown even worse. And we know why. It was to bring the glory to Jesus when he heals her on that day long ago. And so what a great Savior we have in Jesus Christ. So thanks so much for joining us in this lesson. And may God bless you on your journey. And uh, don't forget, does he care? He cares about you more than you can possibly imagine. What a great God we serve. Thanks for listening.